This episode of Paranormal Heart is brought to you by Nodakian Studios. If you're looking for a fine piece of stoneware pottery, check out Nodakian Studios at nodakianstudios.com, as well as on Facebook, where she periodically gives away pieces of pottery. Again, check out Nodakian Studios at nodakianstudios.com. Welcome to Paranormal Heart, a place where people can talk about their paranormal experiences. With your host, Cat Ward. Welcome back, folks, to Paranormal Heart Podcast. I'm your host, Kat Ward. You can find me on the second and last Sunday of each month on Podbean and YouTube. You can also find the show on New Lantern Media, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere you find fine podcasts. Paranormal Heart provides a safe place for people to share their paranormal experiences. Whether it's ghosts, aliens, dogman, sea monsters, or gnomes, this is the place to discuss what you have encountered. If you'd like to be on the show, drop me an email at paranormalheart13 at gmail.com. Happy Holidays, Merry Christmas, Joyeux Noël, Happy Hanukkah, whatever you celebrate, I hope you're having a great one. We're another step closer to saying goodbye to 2020 and welcoming 2021. It sure has been a hell of a ride, and let's hope that 2021 will be easier on us all. Here in Ontario, We've been put into a lockdown as of December 26 for 28 days. Essential businesses such as grocery stores are still open, but the capacity of shoppers has been lessened a great deal. And all I want to say to everyone listening, please remember we're all in this together. Try to be patient while you're waiting in those long lineups. It's so very important to be kind to your fellow humans right now. Emotions are mixed. Many are having a rough time with all the lockdowns and social distancing, especially during this time of year. So no matter what your culture is, what your religious beliefs are, remember, we are all brothers and sisters on this little blue globe, third rock from the sun, and we really need to pull together. So have a happy new year. I wish you all great love, health, prosperity in the new year, and be safe. This episode shout out goes to my wonderful listeners in Russia. Thank you so much for listening, and have a wonderful, safe New Year. Folks, I have loved every guest I've had, but in my last episode of 2020, which is episode 50, my guest has a very special place in my heart. She is a psychic medium whose gifts have given her the ability to tap into timelines providing glimpses into the past, present, and future. She has the ability to connect with loved ones and pets who have passed. She is a dedicated founder and member of Canadian Supernatural Research Society, where the team help people with their paranormal experiences in their homes or businesses. She's also a TV personality, podcast co-host of Let's Talk About It, and a dear, dear friend. I introduce to you, Katie Turner. Hello, Katie. Welcome to Paranormal Heart. Hi, Kat. How are you? I'm doing great, thanks. How are you? Very well, thank you. I'm almost ready for Christmas. I'm not yeah. enjoying the snow, but I am here. Yep. The, I just lost my train of thought. Sorry, you mentioned Christmas and I got all excited. <laughs> I think that happens to the most of us, right? Yeah, I'm still a kid at heart. But by, the, by the time this airs, though, it'll be after Christmas, but it will be uh, just before New Year's. And I'm so excited to have you on because I've, I've loved every guest that I've had, but... You know, like I mentioned in the uh, intro, my current guest has a special place in my heart. Uh, just, I don't know why I haven't had you on before. So, I think we tried, but it just didn't work out with dates and stuff, so. 
Well, thank you. I appreciate it. You have a special place in my heart, too. Um, for those of you that don't know, Kat and I um, are colleagues on the Canadian Supernatural Research Society, the uh, a paranormal team that we do lots of investigations on. So we've been friends for a long time, and uh, we work together in the, in the paranormal field. So yes, there's definitely a special place in my heart. Yeah. Like I said, not that the other guests weren't special, but, you know, we're colleagues, so... You got it. Yeah. So... Tell us, because um, I have mentioned your name a few times in um, with with past guests about various topics. So why don't we just start off with you telling us how you got into the paranormal and when it started, and we'll go from there. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for the mentions, by the way. I truly appreciate oh, that. You're so it all started um, when I was very, very, very young, even before I could recollect. I was, um, I've been psychic my whole life, quite frankly, um, but my parents tell me stories of things uh, that would happen or things that I would predict or see um, when I was very young, just as I could talk. Um, and, you know, as I got older, it never went away. And for lots of people with these childhood experiences, they kind of outgrow it, but mine kept getting stronger. So basically, um, you know, I kept seeing things and hearing things and feeling things. And growing into, uh, you know, a young child, six, seven years old, my parents decided to purchase a farm in, uh, it's, it's still southern Ontario, but it's the north tip of southern Ontario. And so moving on to this farm, you know, the farm was 100 years old at the time. Um, it was quite haunted. So we were having paranormal experiences and I was, you know, really perplexed about it and really couldn't understand it and wanted to know more. So uh, thank goodness my parents are pretty spiritual people and they're open and they engaged me into it and they, you know, they asked me more questions and they never kind of shunned me. And so I was able to develop my, my abilities even more. So fast forward into um, 17, 18 years old, um, I was amateur ghost hunting. I was basically trying to prove to myself that I wasn't crazy. So I would go with friends um, and we would go to abandoned places and we would go to, to different locations and just try and snap photos and get some audio evidence. Um, and then um, it just kept getting stronger, the need, the urge. Uh, when it, you know, rewind a little bit, when I was 14, 15 years old, I really wanted to learn more about this. And we didn't have the internet, you know, as, as um, mainstream back then. So I was in libraries. I was watching any television programs I could get my hands on to try and figure out why I was the way I was. So fast forward into my adulthood and uh, college. We were hunting a little bit more. And after college, I decided to start the team again. And this is where you come in. So I decided to put the team together and let's get some serious hunting. And so today, I'm a full-time psychic medium and paranormal investigator. And TV personality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, TV personality too, for sure. <laughs> but you're still Katie. I'm still Katie. I will always be the cowboy boot wearing Katie. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and the occasional potty mouth. No. <laughs> you got it. Just Occasionally. <laughs> yeah, just occasionally. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, you're so fortunate that your parents recognized it and embraced it and didn't try to make you feel like you were crazy or you're, you're, it's your imagination or you're, you know, you're just dreaming. That's because there's a lot of kids out there, like you and I were discussing before, that they have a really hard time. And then in adulthood, if they still have their abilities, they're still having a hard time because they don't think that they're right. Yes. So, you know, again, I was so lucky. My father is very spiritual. My mother's very spiritual. And my grandmother, uh, my mother's mother, is the most psychic person I've ever met. But she has fear. So um, it's not something that she completely writes off, but it, it has intimidated her. For me, they were able to help me enough that I could kind of understand it more. And, um, you know, to this day, we talk about it. It's something that's a normal at the dinner table conversation. It's not something that was weird or, you know, the monsters or the, the beings that I was seeing was not something that they, they um, fluffed off. So, you know, my, I have two young children at the right now, and those two young children are starting to experiencing things. So I kind of get to see it from my parents' perspective. And, you know, I'm engaging them just as much as they did me. That's amazing. So are they equally, have you noticed, are your kids equally as, um, I don't want to say strong, but are, as gifted? Or is, does one have more of an ability than the other? Have you noticed? 
Yes. So my son um, just demonstrates more of the mediumship. So he sees a lot of uh, dead people and, um, you know, he sees apparitions <clears throat> quite a bit. And my daughter, heaven forbid, keeps getting into my mind and reading my mind. So, you know, the psychic side of her, she's pretty good at it. She yeah, she knows what I'm doing before I'm doing it. And she often tells me, um, you know, when I was back when I was six or seven years old, my parents, I often tell this story, but my parents got a phone call uh, home from school. And the teacher said to them that, you know, Katie's a smart, she's a bright kid, but she's just not in there. She is, you know, I ask her a question and she'll provide the answer, but she's kind of out there. And so my parents had the chat with me and they asked me, you know, Kate, what's going on? And I said to them, well, it's the colors. And it, they were kind of taken aback and they said, the colors? And I said, well, the colors, when the teacher's up at the chalkboard, you know, I can see the colors around her. And what I didn't realize at the time was that I was seeing auras. And so my parents had to have that chat with me and say, you know, it's wonderful that you're seeing these things, but that's not a place at school. So you need to focus. Remember, you're learning and all that stuff. And we can talk about this when you get home. And so that kind of settled me down. So, you know, going back to my children, I'm starting to experience some of these things too, where um, some teachers have, have brought it to my attention that my kids are starting to say some pretty cool things. And, uh, you know, I'm gonna harvest this. I'm going to support them as much as possible. And hopefully they'll, they'll come to their own conclusion as to how sensitive they wanna be and uh, go from there. It doesn't uh, make your children afraid? Do they embrace it? Absolutely not. They're not afraid. I shouldn't say that. Do they embrace it? Yes, they're very po positive and um, supportive of mummy. You know, they say mummy's a ghost hunter and, you know, mummy does her thing. And so they're really supportive about that. Do they get intimidated sometimes with some of the entities they see or the things that happen? Yeah, they do. Yeah, I, grew, I, I live at the moment in a, I don't want to call it haunted, but there is activity here. And so sometimes they'll say, mom, you know, the, the ghost closed the door again or you know they turn my tablet on by itself again or something so it's something that's just kind of normal and we go oh, okay and move on yeah that's amazing because i have met families who um the parents and the children had um, that they were sensitive they, they had abilities themselves and then one of the children just didn't want to have anything to do with it where the other one embraced it but usually the one who doesn't want to have anything to do with it is the one that has the strongest abilities and uh, so i just wondered about your kids if they both embraced it or not that's really good yeah, I, I often tell people, you know, the longer that you ignore it, the harder it's going to knock at your door. So you can try and hide it all you want, but it's going to keep persevering until you acknowledge it. So sometimes it's, once the acknowledgement happens, it actually dies down a little bit, and no pun intended, and um, <laughs> you're able to kind of work with it better. Did, growing up, did you ever have uh, friends who made fun of you or anything like that because uh, you had abilities? Honestly? Uh, no, I was pretty lucky that way. Not to my face, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I had some really great friends, and, you know, they were all supportive. It wasn't something that was talked about. So when I got into high school, it's when it really got bad, and I can tell you that I was, I don't want to say an outsider, but nothing fit. I knew there was something going on more so, like, at first when I was younger, I didn't realize that, that this was not normal, per se, okay? I'm like, what do you mean you can't see dead people? What do you mean you can't, you know, have premonitions or, or see things? Um, but is, when I got into my, you know, high school, uh, I started to realize that I was different than other kids. And so it's not that I struggled with it or that people looked at me or ostracized me, but I just didn't feel comfortable in my skin. And it wasn't until I started ghost hunting and meeting like-minded people and wanting to talk about it more, um, that I really kind of started getting comfortable with myself. So I was never made fun of. I think more I ostracized myself because I felt weird, if that makes sense. Yeah. Maybe you were feeling what other people were feeling, and that's why oh, you kind of, yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, I really look back on my life and look at situations and scenarios that I was a part of, and I think, huh, that wasn't even me. I was picking up on somebody's energy empathically, or, you know, that stomach ache, that headache was actually for somebody else. And, uh, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. You wish that you could have looked at it now, but yeah. you can't. <laughs> yeah. No, growing up, I used to get uh, people making fun of me because I would tell them about dreams would come true and all that, you know, and I was known as the weird one. And um, well, then I, I embraced my weirdness a long time ago, so now I don't care. <laughs> yeah, I own it now. I see yeah. people for a living. You know, when I do readings for people, they say to me, well, you're going to think I'm crazy. And I go, you know what? Like, really? <laughs> 
do you know what I do? I, there's nothing I you can say to me that I'm going to think is weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you might even know it before they mention it. Exactly. <laughs> so tell us about uh, how you started your team and about some of the show, TV shows that you've done. So uh, a few years back, I decided I was going to, uh, I had, you know, a lot of my equipment from before and I decided to invest in some more equipment. So I rounded up a bunch of friends and asked them, you know, they knew what I did and asked them if they'd be interested. And at this point, you know, I still, I didn't necessarily need proof of paranormal anymore, but I wanted to focus on it and, and try and get that physical proof to, to show myself and people. Um, and so uh, with my group of friends, we decided to end up holding kind of an interview process and did a, a casting call, if you like, um, to ask like-minded people if they wanted to join us. And I, you know, I got really great results. We had a lot of people show up and we were able to hand select who we thought, you know, would fit the team well. And some people, you know, I didn't close my doors to some people, but once they realized that it's not necessarily like television, um, some people were disillusioned and they, you know, they realized that it wasn't for them. And then I had the group that was, you know, were, were diehards and, and interested. So, um, you know, once we started getting, I got the team together and explained how things kind of work and how we were trying to um, go about helping people, we just kind of jumped in from there. So from there, um, I was doing readings part time, kind of on the down low. To be honest with you, I was a little intimidated to do readings. It wasn't something I grew up thinking I wanted to do. Um, and I ended up having to quit my full-time job to do that because I had so many requests. So it's become not only, you know, my full-time job, but my life. You're very fortunate that you're able to quit your day job. You know what I am? I'm absolutely blessed. The universe made my life, I don't want to say a living hell, but the universe made my life a lot harder because they really wanted me to do this. And I pushed it for a long time. I, I fought it. I didn't uh, think this was what I wanted to do. I was I was afraid. I'm not going to lie. I was afraid of judgment. I was afraid that, um, you know, I live in a, in a quaint town that's very scientific driven and I just didn't want to be you know, burned at the stake per se. And so um, I am so blessed and so fortunate and so honored that people um, have have embraced me and, and accepted me and welcome me in their arms. So it's great. That uh, you fighting it and uh, what you were just saying kind of reminds me of someone we both know. <laughs> yes. I think there's a lot of people out there that fight their abilities. I think everybody has the ability to um, to use their antennas, I call them, to use their, their sensitivities. I think a lot of people fight it. And I think, again, that judgment, that taboo, um, you know, growing up for myself, and I'm sure I can speak for you too, it wasn't a mainstream thing. You didn't watch no. ghost shows on television. You didn't um, fantasize about, you know, becoming a, a successful uh, paranormal investigator. It was something that was kind of, you know, judge, judgmental. judgmental. Yep. And so, uh, you know, I think now because of these uh, pioneers like Hans Holzer and mm -hmm. uh, Lorraine and Ed Warren and those people, they were able to plow the way for us to be able to sit here comfortably and talk about it. I remember as a teenager reading a book about Ed and Lorraine Warren and I would tell people oh, this amazing book, this amazing couple, and they're like, Ed and who? Lorraine who? But now pretty much anyone has heard about them. Um, so I'm really kind of, I'm, I'm kind of glad that things have, have changed. And I have to say, I think it's because of the TV shows that are out there now that kind of made it popular and, and a little bit more mainstream. And it's not as weird to talk about the paranormal with people now. They don't look at you like you have three heads anymore. Maybe two, but not three. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. I think the World Wide Web has really opened our eyes and television uh, has really uh, helped us. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I, I do, I'm part of a couple shows. I'm proud to say I'm proud of a couple shows. Um, however, not everything is like Hollywood. I try to explain to people that, mm -hmm. you know, Hollywood has its place and it's, it's wonderful for entertainment, but not is everything... Um, as it seems. And so, uh, you know, people, you know, if I, I got one more phone call with somebody phoning me thinking they had a demon in their basement because of TV, oh. um, you know, it's not always like that. So it has its place and it's wonderful and I'm glad it was able to help us. I still think it's got its entertainment factor and I can honestly say any of the television shows that I've been a part of 
uh, have been factual. I'm not wanting to be part of something that's fictional to me. It's not worth it. That's not why I got into the industry. Um, but I just think that you have to remember that not everything is as it seems. Yeah, it's still a business. It's still set for entertainment, and uh, they have to keep the audience's attention somehow. So, of course, they're going to have to change a few things. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And again, the entertainment factor is there. But there are some wonderful shows that, mm -hmm. you know, talk about true experiences, and there's some really legit, respectable paranormal investigators out there that are on TV. And I think if you could tap into that, there's something to, to be learned from them. Yeah. Totally agree. Um, I used to make fun of the TV shows, but now it's like, well, they actually are, part of it is legit. You know, the actual investigating is similar to what you see on TV, but it just, you just don't get evidence as often as they show you on TV. Sometimes it can be pretty long and monotonous and nothing happens and other days you're just doing the interview and talking to the client and you're getting something so paranormal uh you know is a pseudoscience it's not something that we've yeah. mastered and so as investigators that's exactly what we're doing is investigating and trying to come up with something but it's not something physical we're dealing with a non-physical form so trying to find physical evidence whether it be through evps or video or um, you know, electromagnetic fields is something that, again, you can't ask it to jump and it's going to say how high. So you have to remember a lot of these shows are airing, uh, you know, are doing multiple investigations or are using hours or even days to come up with that evidence. Yeah. So what you're seeing in an hour span could have taken a few days to correlate and to get out of. So, you know, again, it's not always as it seems. I think you and I both know with certain members on our team that have come in you know, they have that expectation. They they think that it's going something's going to jump out right away, and it doesn't. And the disillusionment kind of is a wake up call. Yep, it sure is. I think that's why there's a a little bit of a, a trial uh, time for people when they join the team, because you know we don't want them to jump in a hundred percent and the team embrace them a hundred percent, and then they find out it's not for them. Mm -hmm. I think you have to ask yourself. Uh, you know, a couple things if you decide to start a paranormal team or join one. Why is it that you want to investigate? And I don't, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with trying to find evidence. So I kind of categorize those people. To me, ghost hunters are simply that, hunting ghosts. They're looking for their own validation. Hmm. I'm not going to lie to you. If any paranormal team ever says that they're not wanting to find evidence, then I think they're in the wrong business. We're all trying to find that holy grail. We're all trying to find that perfect piece of evidence that can prove that it exists. Hmm. But I think, you know, the reason why we differ from a lot of teams, and not all of them, there's a lot of them that are on the same page as us, is that we're trying to help families. We're trying to put people at ease. We're trying to explain and validate that they don't need to be afraid. And, you know, I think that um, in doing so, we're, we're helping people, we're causing a positive reaction, and we're giving people power back. Exactly. I don't know how many clients we've had where when you first walk into their home, they have this look in their eyes like they're lost. They don't know what to do anymore. Uh, they don't know if they're crazy. They don't know if we're going to think they're crazy. And then as soon as we start easing their minds and start giving them the power back and saying, no, you actually are experiencing something. It's, it's so wonderful to see the people realize that, oh, I'm not crazy. These people actually believe me and they're going to help us. I just, I love that. And, you know, all the clients that we work with, not only do we investigate and help them, but we make friends for life. All yep. of these people know that we're supporting of them all the time, that if they ever have another experience, we're there, that we're uh, not only there to prove paranormal activity, but we're also there to debunk activity. So yep. not every scratch in the wall is paranormal. It could be a mouse, or it could be a door moving, or it could be bad ventilation, or even high levels of EMF. But the bottom line is we're there to try to put them at ease, come up to a conclusion, and help them out. Yep. They've experienced something, and like you said, we got to debunk it to see uh, what's going on, kind of get to the root of, of it all. Mm -hmm. So, um, if getting back to the kids, if do you have any, how could I word this, what words of advice would you give a parent who might be listening who suspects that their child is gifted or they don't believe their kids but they keep saying they see things what what piece of advice would you give them my biggest piece of advice would be to listen to them hear them out 
understand where they're coming from. Not all children are able to articulate the way that we are. They have a hard time describing, they have a hard time coming to a conclusion. Yes, they have uh, wonderful imaginations, but not everything is an imagination. So it's important if you have to write it down, take a little notepad, keep some notes, but engage them. Ask some questions. Where did you see this? Did this person communicate with you? What type of entity was this? Um, did, how did you feel when it happened? Um, you know, did you, do you feel any physical harm? Did anything hurt when they talked to you or, or whatever it is, make sure that you're engaging to them and don't write them off because, uh, you know, all you're doing is causing a bigger butterfly reaction if you don't engage. Yep. And that might even put a wedge in between the parent and the child and the child just doesn't want to open up to their parents anymore because they don't believe what they're saying or, or whatever the reason. Absolutely. I think that, um, by opening up and talking to them and helping them is going to number one show them that they don't need to be afraid and and when you're you're afraid uh, that's when malevolent energy comes in so it feeds off of that fear and it feeds off that negative energy and i think a lot of the mental illness that happens with young children as well as teens today um you know stems from that because i feel they can't open up and talk about it because someone may think they're crazy so by doing uh, that and, and engaging them, I think you're teaching them what they're willing to accept and what they're not, giving their power back, and and also harvesting their abilities, teaching them what they can use to keep communication and to keep themselves protected. Good advice. Yeah, a lot of kids, um, you know, the way I describe it is like a faucet. So everybody brushes their teeth and everybody brushes their teeth a different way. Okay. Some people have the faucet on, on high. Some people have the faucet trickling. Some people turn the water off in between, you know, toothbrush rinses. But the bottom line is the water is where they're comfortable. And so a lot of children who are experiencing paranormal activity um, or, or tapping into their senses are, they don't know how to turn that down. The faucet is turned on high. So it's a high level um, of energy flowing through them. So what I do is I take them through a process and teach them how to turn that water down to where they're comfortable and so that it's not so overwhelming to them and honestly in essence it works with the parents too because they're not so worried there's nothing worse than a than a mother or father and as a parent you know uh you can't help something you can't help somebody you can't see the problem you don't know where it's coming from or you can't communicate with it so it's helpless and once you dial this stuff down it, it helps both child and, and parent that's awesome i, I can't imagine uh, having a family that is not supportive and uh, encourages you to talk about it because my parents uh, always encouraged me because you know, I've told you before about the dreams that I used to have growing up uh, that used to come true and uh, my father was never really a believer in all this psychic stuff and paranormal but then you know mom and I would be talking and she'd say things like did you and I'm like yep she goes okay when and then I and she, we wouldn't even finish the sentences and we already knew what we were talking about and my dad would be sitting there going did you what when what finish your sentences and we and we didn't realize that we weren't finishing our sentences until he brought it up and then he started noticing you know well this is just way too coincidental so now now he believes in it i often tell people you know they say prove that paranormal is real and i tell them to prove it's not you know, this is something that you can't, it's not going to jump out at you. It's not like television in a lot of ways, or Hollywood, anyways, the movie versions of those yeah. things. But if you open yourself up and you open your conscious awareness and you start to absorb things, I think you're going to see a lot more. So lots of times I, I just explain it like the, the red car effect. So you think of your car, the make, the model, and the color, and you mm -hmm. think about how many of those vehicles you noticed before you purchased it. Yep. After you purchased it, you're noticing them more. And it's not as if you are out looking for vehicles like that, but you're consciously aware of them. And it's the same principle. I think a lot of times we write this off as a physical world when really it's happening and we're just passing it by. So once you open that, that eye, you open that um, consciousness up, you're going to see much more. Totally agreed. I've, I get a lot of people, you probably get this question too, but I get a lot of people asking me, um, since you've been investigating, are you having more paranormal experiences? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, 100%. Um, yeah. 
You know, I, I try to encourage people when they want to get into ghost hunting, you know, the first thing they want to do is investigate their own homes. And I really discourage that because you don't want to open up a portal or open up something uh, in your own home and, and be wreak havoc of it. There's been multiple occasions where we've done paranormal investigations and cleansings and I've brought it home. And I'm very due diligent. Um, yep. You know, I've got lots of salt lamps and I have lots of cleansing practices and I do not do in personal readings out of my home. I really try to take care of my family and myself and I still manage to bring some of that home. So, uh, you know, it's important that when you're go getting into any anything like this, any type of investigating that you're really uh, delving into the safety practices that you're carrying whatever you feel is necessary, whether it be crystals or crosses, um, mala beads, anything that you feel will protect you because uh, it's important that you're safe when you're doing this. Yeah. I, I get a lot of people asking me as well, um, what can I carry with me to keep um, negative energies at bay? You know, should it be crystals or should it be a crucifix or whatever? And I always tell them, because this is what I firmly believe in, it's the, the intent is there. So it's whatever, if a fork, if you think a fork is going to give you the power, use a fork you know what i mean um it just it's just something that helps you um concentrate and and um oh, what's the word i'm looking for um oh jeepers i know you can read my mind <laughs> no <laughs> um um, relax is a conduit. Is what yes, it's thank you. Relax yes, is a conduit to, to force the energy. So yeah. I describe it like you know <clears> when <throat> I say to people, cross. A cross is simply a piece of wood or metal, but it's the act of intent yep. that makes it powerful. It's the power of prayer. It's the same with holy water. It's the yeah, intent the meaning that has been implicated and placed into that object that makes it powerful. Now, crystals are a little bit different. Crystals have a vibrational frequency. And mm -hmm. as you know, we're all made up of vibrations. Yep. So crystals, because they give off a certain vibration, can repel certain energies. And it basically doesn't allow it to attach, or it it, it, it mirrors it back, or it takes that energy and, and basically turns it into something else. So whatever way you wanna go about it, not only do crystals help in a vibrational sense, but the, the crosses that you wear, the maladies, anything, those, by you having belief and faith and love in them, that sets off a vibrational frequency as well. So, you know, whatever you feel is necessary, go ahead and do it. With my team, before we enter an investigation, I usually do a silent prayer. I cast this all in white light. I've got my crystals and my metals and my all sorts of things just to, to make sure we're safe. And when we're leaving, I do the same thing. I cast everybody and make sure nobody is taking anything home and, and you go. So for those of you who are not, uh, or who are new to investigating, a lot of people describe what is called a paranormal hangover. Yeah. <laughs> so as we're talking about paranormal investigating and being safe, I want you all to realize that sometimes you're gonna experience the headaches or you're gonna experience the, um, the lack of uh, energy when you get home. That doesn't necessarily mean you have an attachment. It doesn't necessarily mean you've brought something home, but you are feeling the physical effects of what occurred the night before or earlier that day. A lot of times when I come home from an investigation, I can't sleep because I'm just vibrating. I'm just so energized. I'm, I'm tired, but I'm not tired. You know, it's just, and it's, it's kind of neat. You know, the next day, uh, the team, one of the team members will say, okay, who has the paranormal hangover today? <laughs> yep. Yeah, yep. because we're all, it's an expansion <clears throat> of energy. And yep. you're so focused, you're so concentrated, you're so kind of got your walls up to make sure that you're not hurt, that you're um, basically going through that paranormal hangover the next day. Yep. What, um... Do you have a preference for what you're investigating? Do you prefer doing private residences, businesses, historical locations? Like, do you personally have a preference or does it depend on the circumstance of the investigation? For me, it's circumstance. Um, I'm not somebody who wants to dive into every demonic possession. Yeah. Uh, I think yep. there's a lot of uh, paranormal investigators out there that kind of want that scare factor they want that or it, they simply are attached to it at this point it's got it, it's got its talents in you and it's making you want to go to those locations um but i want to i want to go to the places that people are starting to feel physical harm or are scared i want to go to those locations that i feel i can offer the most assistance and make people feel safe um if it comes down to the activity activity is, is activity it's not something that necessarily changes i mean you're still getting hits on different pieces of equipment 
Um, but I love the age of things. So where we live in Canada, uh, it's not very old. So we don't have the privilege of, of necessarily going to places like the UK or things that are centuries old. That would be something definitely on my bucket list that I would love to go to. Same here. Because I'd love to feel the energy off of it, whether it be residual or haunting. Mm -hmm. If ever, I win the, if ever I win the lottery, uh, the team, we're going someplace old. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'd love to go to Romania or, you know, for the architecture, the UK. Like, there's so many places that I'd love to go to. The oldest place that I was ever to that, I, that I'm aware of. Um, so when I was a kid, we went down through Virginia and the Smoky Mountains and all those areas. Uh, and... You know, I was able to go through, through some of the battlefields, and that was pretty awesome. Um, mm -hmm. And we went right down. We were down in St. Augustine, Florida, and we were in the forts there, and the energy was incredible. Uh -huh. um, also, Montreal, some of the cobblestone yeah. streets in Montreal, which are quite old. I was mm -hmm. able to pick up energy there. And, uh, you know, 10 years back, we went to Nassau, Bahamas, and we were able to see some of the old forts, and there was still energy present. And so, wow. um, you know, it just intrigues me. I want to find more. <laughs> yeah. Well, as we all know, you can't really destroy energy. So it it either stays or it goes someplace else. Like it, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> a little tickle in the throat here. It's been a long day. <laughs> it has. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if you were able to go anywhere around the world to do an investigation, what would be your dream investigation? I would, honestly, I would love to go to the UK. We just kind of yeah. tapped into that Scotland and yeah. England. Oh, yes. um, and Italy. I'd love to go to Italy and France mm. and, and go along, you know, the old parts of town. Um, and pick up. I'd also love to go to uh, places like Rome, Nice, mm. and those places because, you know, there's so much history there that, uh, you know, I'd like to go to the the old um, halls where they, you know, they held the gladiators and stuff mm. like that. It would be yeah. great. That would be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'd ever be overwhelmed by going someplace as old as that with the, the energies? I think you could be overwhelmed in any location, really. It depends on how the energy kind of flows. Mm. So, yeah, I think it could be. And, you know, I won't, I've will not only been a handful of really old places we talked about. Yeah. So I, I can honestly, I can't speak from experience because I've never been there, but I really feel like I would kind of um, use different practices to try and not be overwhelmed, you know, surround yeah. myself in light and use different crystals and, and kind of only let a little bit in. And what I do for a living, so in terms of, of doing readings for people, at times it's quite overwhelming. And so I've had to teach myself to kind of push it back a little bit and only accept um, small amounts of it. So I'm hoping I would be prepared to go there. I uh, I would love to, but I, I, I have a feeling that I have a hard time shielding myself sometimes. Um, a lot of times people will tell me, I can't read you. Put your shields down. Well, they're just naturally up. For, for me anyways, it's just uh, something I've subconsciously learned to do a long time ago and sometimes I don't realize that they're up, but... Well, there's certain things that you can do to open yourself up. So I encourage everybody, you know, we've all talked about meditating and, and you know, try to meditate and open yourself up, but there's no sense in meditating if you don't ground yourself first. So no matter, you know, the lights that are in your room, to the car that you drive, to anything that you're using, whether it be a phone or a laptop, all has to be grounded in order to work efficiently. So I really encourage a lot of people who are trying to open themselves up to ground them first, ground themselves first and foremost before you start meditating and opening yourself up because you're going to receive better results if you do and you're going to do it in a cleaner manner and you're going to, it'll be more crisp and precise when you do it. Mm -hmm. How would you explain to the listeners how to ground themselves? So in Canada, um, we are, you know, subjected, I'll say it that way, <laughs> to five or six months of snow. Um, and so it's really hard for us as Canadians, not every part of Canada, but, you know, there are parts that it's hard for us to get our feet in the ground, in the sand, in the water, in the grass, six months of the year, seven months of the year. So I often tell people to have a bath. It's important to, uh, I tell people to get some salt. It doesn't matter what kind of salt you want to use and get a candle, light a candle. And I encourage you to soak uh, for at least 20 minutes. And it's important to do this at least once a month. 
okay? For the purposes of, of grounding anyways. Um, you know, if you can do it every other day, if you can do it once a week, as many times as you can to help that grounding process. And you know, the candle and the water and the salt, it's not for aesthetics, it's not for calming per se, but it's getting all of the natural conduits in order and balance, so your electromagnetic fields all in a balanced manner. So you have your fire, which is your candle, you have your earth, which is your salt and your water and your air. And when those um, elements are balanced, it helps to draw the bad energy or bad electromagnetic fields out of your body. So using the water as it drains out of the bathtub, it's, it's taking that energy with it and it's using a natural conductor to do so. That is more successful than anything. A lot of people may not want a bath, and I actually have a salt ball that you can purchase, you know, locally. You can purchase at Walmart. You can purchase it. I don't want to name plug, but there's different stores you can purchase it at. Yeah. And um, basically, you go over your body with it when you're in the shower. So, you know, whatever you can do to kind of get rid of that negative energy or get rid of that energy that doesn't serve a purpose... Um, is going to help to ground and then from there you can work on opening up your, your third eye or your uh, spiritual senses hmm. good advice i knew about the uh the bath and everything but i didn't know about the uh salt balls or whatever yeah so hmm. you can get them honestly they're a few bucks um you can get them at different stores metaphysical stores you can get them at there's you know play, larger box stores you can get them at um and they're not expensive but you know canadian they'd be anywhere between three and five dollars canadian hmm. um and you know they're they're probably a little bit bigger than a golf ball and mm -hmm. you can use them they're different shapes and you can use them at the same time as you're showering so it helps to kind of get rid of and draw that energy out well that's interesting i have to look into that i'm pretty sure the store that we like to go at to in uh, Pembroke, I'm pretty sure they sell that. Absolutely, yes, they do. Yeah, they're they're wonderful. Um, you know, if you're if you're not in a position where you can shower or bath, and I know it sounds silly, but some people are in and out no. people, or they yep. don't have a lot of time. Um, you can use smudging techniques as well. Um, you know, you can use sage and Palo Santo and different things to to ground. But I always encourage a natural conduit to get rid of that energy. Now. <clears throat> Excuse me. I I use sage as as you know. Uh, but what does a Palo? I can never pronounce it. Palo Santo. Yeah, why Palo do Santo you mix is, that? I'm sorry. It's why why do you mix it with uh, the sage? So. Um, you have to think of fuel, okay? So in Canada, we have three mixes of fuel besides diesel, but three mixes <laughs> of fuel. We have regular, mid range, and premium. Right. So white sage is what is most widely used. Mm -hmm. And I would I would rate white sage at about a regular fuel level. As you go up, so uh, Pablo Santo is the same way. It's it maybe a mid-range fuel. And I have uh, blue sage, which is more of a premium fuel. So it's not that it's, it's less effective. It's just one is more potent than the other. Mm -hmm. So depending on the circumstance of where you're cleansing or what you're using it for, I would encourage different things. I also use mugwort. I also use cinnamon. Mm -hmm. I also use cedar. Um, we've used uh, blue, uh, dragon's blood. So that's, a, that's another essence, frankincense, mm -hmm. uh, myrrh. There's different things that you can use as a cleansing practice that's going to help to get rid of that energy. I'd never heard of the blue sage. Yeah, so uh, blue sage is, is a finer uh, grade of sage. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a little finerly wound. So when you buy them in bundles, it's a smaller leaf. Um, and it's just a little higher octane. It's something that I use on more sticky energy. So if you know somebody's been dealing with paranormal activity for quite some time, and I feel it really needs kind of a um, a, a little harder elbow grease, I'll mm -hmm. use that. You can also use uh, singing bowls. So singing bowls change the vibrational frequency of things too. Mm -hmm. So it's important to to try different things if one thing's not working. Interesting. Yeah, I think you've only used the bowls a couple of times in investigations. Yeah, I. other than that, I hadn't really, uh, I don't even think I've ever held one. Isn't that funny? Uh, the, so if for anybody who's wanting to get into bowls, bowls are something that picks you. You don't pick the bowl. So I received my bowl from a, a Buddhist monk, a retired um, Buddhist monk, a very high member, um, who taught me uh, how to use it and encouraged me to, to keep using it because I was quite intimidated once I learned about it. Mm -hmm. There's actually seven precious metals in, in a, a real bowl. There's uh, their hands uh, carved and hand and, and oh. um, beaten, if that's what you want to call it, shaped. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's ins and outs of it. You should never have a bowl on a table. You should always honor it with a pillow and so on. So. You know, it's a little bit more upkeep, but it's worth it. Huh. Yeah, I don't know too much about the bowls. So you should just let them sit on a, like a, a pillow? 
So there's an honor pillow that usually will come with the bowl, or if not, you should purchase oh. it separately. But you want to honor the bowl and mm -hmm. um, uh, keep it off the floor. Oh, good advice. Mm -hmm. So what would you tell people that would like to start a paranormal, if they want to start doing paranormal investigating, how would you tell them to go about starting? If you really want to start paranormal investigating, I really encourage you to do some research. Don't be afraid to get on the internet. Now beware of what you read. Everybody has a different opinion. This is a pseudoscience. I don't necessarily think there is a right or wrong way to investigate other than the obvious. So conjuring, I don't agree with. Using certain practices or Satanism. Uh, disrespect, I don't agree with. But for the purposes of using different equipment or what you should use and shouldn't use, I don't think there's necessarily a wrong answer. I think it's important that you find somebody who's reputable, find a team that you have respect for or that is close to your community that's willing to teach you and learn. Go and take some you know, time with them. It's also very important in the paranormal community uh, that you not be charged. So if there's any teams out there that think that they're going to charge money to come in and investigate a location, perhaps find another team because that's not why we got into this. There's no such thing as an expert in the paranormal field they'll tell you that but you know I don't like to call myself that at all I think I'm yeah. seasoned um, but I think that uh, you know you got to find those people that, that have been in the game for quite some time and can give you assistance I sometimes tell people when they ask if we charge um, I'll say no we don't but maybe a coffee or the occasional cookie would be nice <laughs> yeah donations only <laughs> yeah. it's a labor of love you know it is people you know that's why we got into it and it's so important that um, people realize that you know, you don't go to school for this. There's no courses per se. There's not a university degree. Um, you know, there are parapsychologists that have taken the time to learn the, sci the science side of things. Yeah. Um, but we're all learning and it's important to learn off of each other. I mean, I've been psychic my whole life and I'm still learning every mm -hmm. single day. So if you find somebody who thinks they know it all, maybe find somebody else. Yeah, you have to try and find someone who doesn't put the ego in the paranormal. Uh, because as soon as that happens, that's just, to me, that's just negative energy. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's taking it away from the, the act of the investigation, right? Yeah. It, it, virtually what we're trying to do is find answers for the client. So, um, you know, we're trying to establish that, that scientific research or that paranormal um, research to try and give them an answer. Exactly. How do you put a dollar and cents on that? You can't. I used to make fun of people saying that they're going to be teaching how to do paranormal investigations and I started thinking about it after a while and if you have someone who's reputable, um, who actually cares about teaching other people the proper way, teaching them about proper equipment, how to use the equipment, you know, the equipment we use, like the um, EMF detector, it's not a ghost detector, it was made originally for something else, so you got to learn how to use your equipment just because you're getting a reading you got to find out why are you getting a reading so I think these people that are giving some classes you really have to look into what they're teaching first of all and how much they're going to charge you if it's an arm and a leg I would suggest not to take it because they're just in it for the money but if somebody legit wants to teach you how to do it the proper way you know um, like you said be respectful when you do investigations don't antagonize don't dare the entities to show themselves you know things like that um, I think that's uh, that's a good thing and I'm, I'm hearing more and more people kind of giving little little classes lately um, and like I said I used to make fun of it and didn't think it was right but I started thinking and it's like well it's not necessarily a bad thing but l like anything else you're gonna have people that are gonna try and gouge you and other people who actually want to teach you Absolutely. I think it's, you know, when you when you look at it, the mythology of it is a good thing. Okay, methodology is important. Um, how to be respectful and how to, you know, utilize the equipment the most efficient you can, the right and wrongs, ins and outs and do's and don'ts are good. And again, I agree with you 100%. If somebody's going to take the time and, and host a class um, with it, then that's good. But I think when somebody presents you with a certificate that says you're now an official ghost hunter, there's no such thing as official ghost, ghost hunter. So no. passing knowledge and teaching tutoring is good, but to belong to say that you belong to some sort of a, a club, ah, I think you're paying more for the membership. Yeah, agreed. So I know you have to go pretty soon because uh, you have other 
other uh, endeavors or <laughs> other things to take care of. But I just wanted to ask if you could talk about any one of the investigations that you've done that that you'll never forget. Can you describe any investigation that really just sticks in your mind? There are, uh, oh my goodness, there's so many. <laughs> uh, there are two that come to light. One um, is, of course, and I'm sure you've talked about it many times, Buck Hill. One mm -hmm. of the first times we went to Buck Hill, Ontario, which is in Round Lake, Ontario, and it's a very haunted road um, that we experienced crazy paranormal activity from shadow figures to a broken windshield to rocks being thrown to um, doppelganger mimicking to like so many things that is most definitely an investigation I will never forget there's also another investigation um, that actually was was featured on uh, season 5 of Paranormal Survivor and uh, it was of a, a local uh, mother and her children were experiencing some activity and um, basically, there was this green type of elemental, I, I can't, lizard man that uh, showed himself. And I was upstairs in this old second floor house, um, and it, it was it was the scary, one of the scariest moments I've ever had. I think I felt vulnerable because I didn't know where to go. And uh, that will forever be haunted in my mind. Forever, I will never forget those moments. Because the eyes, the this thing coming towards me, you know, if somebody had, else had said that they'd seen this particular apparition or, or um, anomaly, I would have said, yeah, okay, you're forgetting your meds. But me seeing it myself, <laughs> knowing I was perfectly sane, you know, not under the influence of anything, um, and had the physical evidence to back it up, mm -hmm. yeah, it happened. And I'll never forget it. I think that was an investigation that I had moved away for a couple of years. I don't think I was here for that one. But yes, I remember you yes. guys talking you about to take it. You a hiatus for a few years, but you're back. Yes, I'm back. <laughs> like it or not. No. <laughs> we, we wanted you back, girl. Well, it's funny because, uh, folks, um, I moved away from the Ottawa Valley for about three years. And we thought we're going to be retiring to the West Coast. Well, not coast, but out west. And Katie kept saying, no, you'll be back in three years. I'm like, no, we're retiring. No, three years. I'm like, Katie, no, we're going to be retiring there. Okay, whatever, three years. And then when we found out that we're moving back, as soon as I found out, I can't remember if I called you or texted you or I messaged yep. you. And I'm like, son of a bitch, Katie, three years. <laughs> Pardon my French. I know. It was, I'm like, really? <laughs> I was happy to come back, though. I, we're happy to have you back. Yeah, Thanks. We love it. Well, is there any final thoughts that you would like to give us? Uh, tell the listeners where they could contact you, and um, we'll call it a day and let you move on. Um, if I could leave anybody with, with anything, I think it's, you know, please don't be intimidated by paranormal activity or things you can't explain. Don't be afraid to reach out. You're more than, uh, you know, welcome to reach out to myself or Kat or any local yep. teams that are reputable to get some answers. Uh, you know, if this is something you feel you want to start up, again, find reputable people that are willing to help you. Um, and, you know, you can reach us. If you ever have any questions, you can certainly reach me. Um, I have my Katie Turner Sensitive Psychic Medium page. You can shoot me a message that way. You can hit us up uh, through the Canadian Supernatural Research Society through Facebook. You can hit us at our websites, katieturnerpsychic.com or uh, canadiansupernaturalresearchsociety.com. And you can also hit me up uh, every Sunday night. So my very dear friend Richard Ruland from uh, the States and myself host a live Facebook show, video show through New Lantern Media um, every Sunday night, Eastern at 8 p.m. Eastern. So uh, you're welcome to, to tap in. It's interactive. You can ask as many questions as you'd like. And we try to educate viewers on all things paranormal. And it's called Let's Talk About It. Let's talk about Let's it. Let's talk about it. It's it's simple, yeah. but it says so much, and it's a great show, folks. I highly re encourage you to to check it out. So you. so you don't have to remember all of the uh, the locations Katie mentioned. I will be adding all the links to the show notes, so it'll be easy for you to just click and uh, go where you need to. Well, thank you so much, Katie. I really appreciate this. Oh my goodness, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. You're my soul sister, so anytime, dear. Awesome. So thanks again, and uh, give my best to the family. I will, you too. 
Thanks. We'll chat soon. Chat soon. Well, we've made it to the end of another episode. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, take care of each other. And if you'd like to be on the show or have questions and comments, just drop me an email, paranormalheart13 at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. Paranormal Heart would like to extend a special thank you to PurplePlanet.com for supplying the music for the show. The views and opinions expressed on Paranormal Heart are those of the host and participants. 